this whole question of disruption. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking uh, as we think about what we've been up to for the last few years, Yes, in my case, mm -hmm. at least? Um, I think it's um, our approaches, you know, how we are um, mining fields mm -hmm. and opening them up to be more expansive mm -hmm. in the way we think about Impressionism um, and contemporary artists like Micheline Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, I think that allows for um, kind of different ways to engage mm -hmm. with the work and also even if it is 19th century, mm -hmm. um, a kind of contemporary lens. Yes, yes. That was very important mm -hmm. to me. And that we had a lot of discussions with my exhibition, Posing Modernity, uh, with 5,000 square feet of gallery space. Can you really do a compelling show with a narrative that spans 18, from 1860s, Manet, the early years of Impressionism in France, all the way through to living artists of today? But I felt that part of what would make the 19th century compelling for the audience that we wanted to draw, which was we, we certainly wanted the folks who always come to see a Manet or an Impressionism show, uh, but we wanted the folks who might think about that as something that doesn't have relevance for them today. And for me, one of the ways to really make that relevance manifest is to show how the living artists that they admire and know are, were so deeply engaged with history themselves and explicitly evoking it. So one of the things that I really tried to do in the contemporary section of my show, there were really kind of two narratives. One was a set of images by contemporary artists like Micheline Thomas and Elizabeth Columba and Lorraine O'Grady, Renee Cox, that directly related to specific 19th century works in the show. And I literally would see, or people, uh, the guards, the security guards, uh, who were often themselves artists, by the way, would tell me about how they saw someone sit in front of the Micheline or the Ellen Gallagher, and then go back to the 19th century, or go back to Matisse to really look at him again. Uh, people sent me emails saying that they had not seen themselves in the work of Degas, even as they admired the lovely aspect, as we understand it today, of his, uh, those uh, ethereal portraits or paintings of ballet dancers. But the fact that he uh, made that entire series of portrayals of Miss Lala, the black circus worker who lived and worked in this at the same time and in the same neighborhoods of Paris, uh, where the opera de Paris was, where Matt, uh, Degas was sitting at the opera and, and drawing the ballet dancers. It, it just made that whole world much more vivid for them. And I've gotten uh, uh, emails from people who said, or students who said that when they do their summer tour of Europe or they're gonna be, they have a fellowship to travel in Paris, they're going to use the map that I included in, uh, in the galleries as well as in the catalog to do a walking tour of that area. So that tells me that the intensity of the curiosity uh, emanated from their understanding how this historical art is a living legacy for today. I, I really wanted to make that point. So they're almost like references, yes. right? So they serve as, um, so when you think about Le Déjeuner sur la Herbe, mm. Manet, you, and you look at Micheline Thomas's yes. Le Déjeuner sur la Herbe, yes. Trois Femmes Noires, yes. you have that immediate reference connection. and connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do help it along with the text, with our, with our text, you know, with the actual, um, image, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, a Manet's image, mm -hmm. but it allows, as you say, mm -hmm. um, viewers to make those connections, even yes. if they, because, you know, art is scary. Mm. You know, uh, people often say, you know, I'm intimidated. I don't know this history. Um, it's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. What are the entry points? Like, mm -hmm. how can I actually access um, this 
you know, art, mm -hmm. um, 19th century, French mm -hmm. Impressionist, whatever, French mm -hmm. uh, Impressionist, whatever it is. Um, and I think this allows, mm -hmm. your show allows um, that to happen. Mm -hmm. And then your show is like the, the primer you know, Absolutely. it's like that you, you it's the roots of it. And then so you can go through the entire museum and um, or from, you know, your show to our shows and mm -hmm. just have all of these wonderful connections, art historical yes. connections. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there was a great quote that I came across in working on this exhibition. Um, a critic of the Impressionist movement was grappling with, he said, these artists who admire tradition and hate it for the same reasons, and they hmm, break it uh, for the same reasons. And Manet was so obviously doing that and looking at Titian and looking mm -hmm. at Renaissance artists. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's so amazing about the McLean show is that she's doing the same thing. Exactly. These artists admire exactly. tradition and they want to break it for that very same reason. Absolutely. And that is one of the ways in which I think we can push back against this idea that art history is some fortress of culture that is walled off from contemporary mm -hmm. life and from the understanding of people of our own time by pointing out that these contemporary artists are remaking uh, uh, images that go way back in history and that those images themselves were successively the remake of previous images. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Titian was looking at antiquity, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Greek and Roman antiquity in his era of the Venetian Renaissance. And then Manet is looking at Titian and Michelin is look, looking. Mich look, looking at Manet, but mm -hmm. also looking mm -hmm. at all of it. And the other thing about Michelin, uh, 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 Les Femmes Noires, Trois mm -hmm. Femmes Noires, is that she's looking at the, uh, the uh, conventional historical images of Impressionism, Manet, mm. but she's also looking at the lesser known legacy, lesser known for many uh, segments of the audience, which is uh, the Harlem based mm -hmm. African American artist, uh, beginning with the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the Melinda by William H. Johnson, mm -hmm. which was a, de a direct evocation of Olympia. And then she is more explicitly evoking uh, Romare Bearden, who himself was mm -hmm. looking at William H. Johnson mm -hmm. and at Mann. So Bearden was the one who said, and I think he acknowledged he was quoting somebody, I can't remember who, but he said, art is made from art. Art yeah. is made from art. And each successive generation of artists looks at, has to decide how uh, he or she will place themselves within this legacy that goes back into history and uh, in a way that speaks to uh, the present moment. And I really think, I keep thinking about that quote because I think it has everything to do with the narratives that we, that we are all trying to set forth in our exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say, Caroline, when I saw your Impressionist exhibition, I, I really did think about that whole idea of how do you break down you know, those walls around Impressionism. And I think that what you did was just a prototype for other exhibitions about the subject in that you were fully evoking all of the formal you know, uh, qualities that we so admire today about Impressionism, but you were showing it more as it existed in its own time, the grittiness, the fact that it was showing you know, all different aspects of the Industrial Revolution of the of the 18 of late late 19th century Paris, and I just really appreciated having those lesser known perspectives on the subject that we all think we know so much about. So I was curious to know. Um, you must have, like all of us, you're studying art history and you're looking at the landscapes and the still lives and the portraits. How did you come to think? Uh, about this particular take on Impressionism? Well, very early on, there was a textbook that I read that kind of was pulling out some of these images mm -hmm. and showing the, these industrial representations alongside the more leisurely stories. And Impressionism is so often associated with recreation and leisure yes. mm -hmm. and sunny landscapes. Mm -hmm. 
um, which has something to do with the early writing of art history, going way back in even to the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, art historians focused on the movement as one of leisure, and that's persisted, especially in exhibition practice in yes. museums. Mm -hmm. But in the last few decades, art historians have started a little bit more, more and more, to pull out these stories of industry. And so I saw in my undergraduate years these representations of industry and thought that that's a subject, we should think about that. Mm -hmm. And so just continued ruminating on that, noticing these paintings for the most part in other museums as, um, as I went to museums around Europe and North America. And when I came here to the AGO, I noticed that the collection is particularly strong in representations of industry and labor. Mm -hmm. And so I proposed this subject as an idea for an exhibition here. And the goal really is to do just what we've been talking about, broadening the way we look at a time period. Mm -hmm. Works of art are inevitably part of a lived experience, mm -hmm. and that lived experience is a broad one. Mm -hmm. The Impressionist modern artists of the late 19th century in France lived in this period of tremendous change, and they grappled with that change and what it meant for them and uh, for all different parts of society, of the society that they lived in. And so what we wanted to do is show that Impressionism isn't just about those sunny landscapes mm -hmm. and leisure scenes. You see more than women in highly tailored dresses on par with parasols. Here we get to see laundresses working in steamy rooms in Paris. We get to see miners with helmets mm -hmm. facing off against the men who ran those factories mm -hmm. alongside the workers who were driving the construction sites mm -hmm. and working the docks. Mm -hmm. And so broadening the people who we see represented mm -hmm. in works of art in late 19th century France or in Impressionism, it was really what we were hoping to do with this show, just yes. broadening the understanding of the movement as one that uh, is more inclusive than we realize. And I will say uh, that part of my show that dealt with the 19th century mm -hmm. with Manet and the early, the pre, um, uh, the early years of Impressionism, the same thing, uh, trying to create a, trying to evoke uh, in a more complete way, mm -hmm. the lived experience of the artist uh, who were making these images. And one aspect of that was absolutely that uh, there was there was leisure, there was class, there were issues of the changing roles of women, but there was also a racial presence, uh, the presence of a racially diverse artistic milieu in a period of French history that was in the immediate aftermath of the 1848 French abolition of territorial slavery. So you had, there had always been a small population of color in Paris and around France, but there were socioeconomic forces that were increasing that presence, not by huge numbers. That didn't happen until the middle of the 20th century. But enough that as these artists adapted the, um, the exhortation of the art, uh, the art critic and the poet, Charles Baudelaire, mm -hmm. to become painters of modern life and to turn away from tradition and go out into the streets and paint every aspect of what they saw, part of what they saw was this presence of people of color in every walk of life. And one of the things that I did want to show that it was in every walk of life. You look at the paintings, the paintings that are shown at the Salon, and they tended to fit the um, kind of archetypal uh, images where the black woman is portrayed as a servant to a white figure, uh, an employer. She's always shown with her employer. To show the black figure on her own, to show the black woman on her own, uh, which Manet did in his portrait of Laura, the same model who posed the maid uh, in Olympia, mm -hmm. and to 
to look at photography, not just at painting, and to see there were women who were matrons, were middle class matrons, uh, were actresses, were journalists, were performing all these different roles that you didn't necessarily see in the paintings that had to be shown, had to survive the conservative taste of the judges for the salon. So just trying to broaden, uh, pr 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 uh, to present a broader sense of what the world of Manet and the Impressionists actually look like. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the great gifts of your show mm -hmm. that by bringing these works together in the same space and putting them in dialogue with each other we see them in a way that we hadn't seen them before. That's such an amazing gift to be able to see works put in a new context and so you flesh out this context and this history around the works that brings them to life in a new way which is really a thrilling experience. I hope. I hope. And then, you know, from the perspective of the artist, I mean, we art historians can do that with our narratives, mm -hmm. but then we see Michelin as an mm -hmm. artist, and we see other artists doing this as well. And mm -hmm. I can specifically remember when I first started working with Michelin mm -hmm. uh, back in 2011, 12, uh, I was asked by Lisa Melandri, who was then at the Santa mm -hmm. Monica Art Museum, to write an essay for the first solo show, I think, uh, museum solo show in the US mm -hmm. by Michelin. And it turned out that she was an artist in residence at Monet's Giverny at mm -hmm. the same time that I was a dissertation fellow at Columbia's Paris campus. And so I go out to her studio and um, to research my article, and I see these photographs that are maybe eight by 10 at mm -hmm. the largest, sometimes even smaller, uh, of the models Marie and Den and the others. And then six months later, I visit her studio in Brooklyn and that photograph, that black and white photograph, has been it's blown up into a uh, visually mm -hmm. opulent 10 by 12 foot painting. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that she is starting with this, this very basic, you know, sort of fundamental way of conceiving uh, these images that broaden the way we think about a particular period mm -hmm. and the way we think about the figures that were to a large extent left out of our history. And then just almost, I think the, the monumentality of her scale is, is a form of insistence. It's like she's saying, you're not going to ignore. We're mm -hmm. not going to ignore. We're going to acknowledge. We're going to own. Um, one of the things I remember from your exhibition, a quote from Michelin, was that she was saying, we're not uh, reclaiming or... We were uh, sort always. Of, we've always been mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but yeah. we've been invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the theme of my exhibition, this idea that there was a black presence mm -hmm. that was invisible even though it was in plain view uh, because it was ignored in the narratives and because images were, uh, there was a selection of some images over others and so the full extent of the images images of these figures was invisible. So the way she excavates that in the films, Eartha Kitt, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's an in insistence, yes. you know, that, um, that that presence cannot be ignored. Right. Um, right. What's fascinating about watching viewers in the space, mm -hmm. standing in front of the paintings mm -hmm. and walking, and engaging with the gaze mm -hmm. of the subject mm -hmm. whose gaze is unwavering. Mm -hmm. So really, you, you, know, you can walk to the elevator mm -hmm. and you know, the subjects are following you. So it's as if to say, you, can, you, know, you can't ignore us. Mm -hmm. We are, as the quote mm -hmm. says, we've mm -hmm. always been here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fascinated by that kind of um, about that insistence, because mm -hmm. it is a kind of, it is a reclaiming, it is an insistence, it is, a, and, but it's also an homage to Manet and Monet, et cetera. Thank you. Thank and you. it's also, um, you know, Micheline saying, these artists were controversial in mm -hmm. their own time. Exactly. You know, Corbet, mm -hmm. the Sleepers, ah, Corbet. you know, um, they, they had some, you know, the salon wasn't exactly happy with right. them. They, they often didn't show. That's exactly. part of why impressionism happened. They exactly. started doing their own shows. Exactly. And then for Micheline to take those mm -hmm. images and mm -hmm. those paintings and mm -hmm. then insert, mm -hmm. you know, black women, mm -hmm. it, it really is quite radical. It is. It is. 
And I don't know, I just think that part of what we're all doing is, I mean, when I think again about uh, Caroline's Impressionism show, the other thing I see in the show are all of these images of workers, everyday mm -hmm. working people, like you said, the laundress, the steel worker working on the Eiffel Tower, the uh, factory laborers. And so this, again, this fortress, you know, of impressionism that's been constructed by art history and by the selection of the scenes at the opera, uh, the cafe dansant, you know, the dance, uh, uh, the, out, the open air dance uh, scenes of Renoir or the uh, salon societies, the portraits. That was definitely part of modern life, but that wasn't all of modern life. The artists in a lot of ways were far more democratic than the historians. Mm -hmm. and that they, they really did paint everything they saw. You know, roam the boulevards, but go down all those alleyways of, you know, those, uh, those medieval quarters that were photographed by, I think it was Marville, mm -hmm. um, before they were bulldozed by Osman to create the broad boulevards, and to just show every aspect of life. And that included working, everyday working people and um, Manet describing the absent drinker, who was mm. essentially a, a street alcoholic mm. as a street philosopher, and feeling that these people were as much the subjects, uh, as worthy subjects of fine art, of uh, portraiture, as any aristocrat or a politician or whatever. I mean, I, I really think that that kind of um, open-mindedness or broad uh, uh, view of society Society is part of what made modern art modern in its own time uh, when the typical subject would be history painting or so, so I think that if we can just look at the artist, you know, try as much as possible to look at the, look at the artist in the most complete way possible. Uh, they were often bohemian. They were often impoverished. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Monet did not make money until he, until well into his career and was, you know, uh, uh, forced to move from various residences, even with his wife and child. If we can bring those stories to the fore, mm -hmm. I think again, uh, we broaden the range of people who can relate to this material. Well, it humanizes the artists mm -hmm. as well. It humanizes you them. Absolutely relate to mm -hmm. you know poverty and mm. you know the the kind of will to c continue and passion mm -hmm. you know um, to continue your art mm -hmm. despite mm -hmm. you know all of the um, adverse uh, conditions yes. in which you're living. Yes, um, I think if those aspects of artists were treated, you know, kind of um, uh, in, in a very clear way in our texts, in our wall exactly. texts, if, you know, to just exactly. reveal a little bit about who they are. Right. I think that just opens up again how uh, audiences would relate. Because right. to know that a, an, an artist that we think with such esteem, mm -hmm. you know, like Manet was actually struggling, mm -hmm. That's, that's quite sobering, mm -hmm. right? And I think, mm -hmm. the, again, this kind of human quality that mm -hmm. comes into play and you get to see and look at the work in a completely different way. I mean, when mm. I think about those factories, when I think about who was working in those factories, right. when I think of the rag pickers, when, you know, these the are, yeah, these are, you know, uh, abject conditions at right. times. So right. how does one begin to relate? Right. Um, and I think that's another way, that's what your show is absolutely doing. How do we relate to this time mm -hmm. from our perspective, mm -hmm. from a 21st century mm -hmm. lens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, which is very difficult to do, but which is what you do. Right? Yes, <laughs> really, absolutely. <laughs> And which I think you show us, Micheline does as well. I think about the films and the way she's evoking these voices of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, Alice Walker in The Color mm -hmm. Purple, Eartha Kitt. Mm -hmm. um, Moms Mabley. Moms <laughs> Mabley. It's, talk about a democratic oh range of artists Absolutely. that she's willing, or a black woman yep. that she's willing to point to as yep. icons and role models. Mm -hmm. Moms Mabley, mm -hmm. um, Nina Simone, uh, people who were ostracized, Josephine ridiculed Baker. in their own time. Yeah. And yeah. And she's putting them right up there and saying these were our ancestors mm -hmm. and you need to know them we need to you know need them to know you need to know them and are. we need to yeah. know them 
Yeah. And, and I wanted to ask you, uh, I, one of the devices I think Micheline really used in those films mm -hmm. was uh, sort of it showing herself inhabiting these roles mm -hmm. so that with the Eartha, uh, the Eartha Kitt uh, Muse, Muse. film, mm -hmm. right, she is, uh, she is assuming the same, uh, she's performing right. as Los Eartha Angeles Kitt Negros. Right. and right. other uh, 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 associates, mm -hmm. people that she knows who are close to her mm -hmm. personally are doing so as well. What do you think she was trying to say with that? I was really intrigued by that. Yeah, um, I think there's so many readings mm -hmm. of that um, uh, installation. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the song is this kind of lamentation mm -hmm. um, um, that Kit sings, you know, where are the black angels? You yes. know, a, uh, painters, if you paint with love, mm -hmm. paint me a black angel mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this idea of erasure mm -hmm. and absence mm -hmm. and Micheline wanting to issue a corrective mm -hmm. by including this chorus mm -hmm. of women, mm -hmm. uh, of black women dressed the way um, Kit was dressed, so inhabiting, you know, Kit, uh, the kind of personification of mm -hmm, Kit, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of emotions and mm -hmm, the kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, poetry mm -hmm. um, uh, that deeply resonate mm -hmm. with what uh, Kit is trying to evoke. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that all kind of um, parceled in the in Kit as a muse, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, fierce activist, mm -hmm. performer, mm -hmm. uh, who was exiled, um, whose uh, life was so fraught with, yes. you know, violence and trauma and how she um, really overcame that. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of that is, you know, uh, is felt, those emotions are mm -hmm. so kind of visceral in, in that piece. And, um, and the fact that it's a chorus, you know, they're, they're talking to each other, right. much like, do I look like a lady? Mm -hmm. A chorus of voices, mm -hmm. you know, performers and comedians mm -hmm. in this kind of intersectional mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's really quite uh, genius mm -hmm. um, because it is, again, this idea of a multiplicity of voices, a multiplicity of of women, mm -hmm. uh, a range of black women, so that it isn't, it removes the kind of, uh, you know, homogenous mm -hmm. idea of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the single black woman. Yes. You know, um, and all of these women, and you see it in Kit, the kind of vulnerability. Yes. You know, I talked mm -hmm. about this earlier, you can edit that out, um, <laughs> about, um, you know, this notion of the strong black woman, right? right? Which I think McLean is always, you know, trying to disrupt, yes, to push against, because the, beneath that strength is a vulnerability and, and a femininity, and a femininity, it and is, a beauty, and mm -hmm. a, you know, there's all kinds of other, you know, qualities. Mm -hmm. But we always kind of, to me, that's a, that's a huge burden, mm -hmm. and, which mm -hmm. she really ruptures. Mm -hmm. um, and in every single element in the show, that's why it's a collage. Mm -hmm. We see that rupturing, and that's yes. collage. You know, you right. know the disparate. Right. Um, materials right. and images, right. you know, ruptured mm -hmm. and put back together in a completely different way. Collage is some, that's something I did think a lot about, especially mm. for the second half of my show, and mm. that I again saw with uh, in Micheline's mm -hmm. work, and thinking about the layers of collage that she's evoking. She is obviously looking at Romare Bearden, mm -hmm. that 1960s, uh, 70s uh, uh, collagist, mm -hmm. uh, making images that as he himself wrote, directly engage with Matisse and with Manet, but also uh, Egyptian tomb sculpture mm -hmm. and uh, the aesthetics of the African mask. Mm -hmm. uh, so this Pentecost, I, can, uh, right, mm -hmm. fabrics, yep. materials, mm -hmm. patterns, yep. and the way that all of these influences are what shape who we are today. Mm -hmm. We're, we all have this culturally hybrid, um, uh, 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 makeup mm -hmm. in our society, in our lives, in our worldview, and collage becomes almost emblematic of that by cutting and pasting, pasting. and piecing mm -hmm. these disparate things together. 
uh, we show, we manifest this hybrid, hy this cultural hybridity, hybridity. that mm -hmm. we're all made from. Yep, and absolutely. seeing Micheline do that, uh, Bearden did it in paper. Uh, Matisse did it in a paper as well. Mm -hmm. uh, in my show, we had uh, his monumental uh, cut out. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the other ways that art history can be interesting. Matisse's cut paper paintings were a collage, but part of how we separate him out from everybody else who's doing collage and uh, construct him as a unique master is to call <laughs> his collages cutouts mm -hmm. or cut paper. Um, and But he himself showed and talked about complete affinity with other artists who were working in the same way. And, and the subjects of his collage. We see cut paper paintings, we see the swimming pool and the landscapes and the f floral motifs, et cetera. And this uh, cut paper uh, collage was Creole Dancer. And yeah. it was an evocation of the African-American choreographer, Catherine Dunham, oh, mm -hmm. who we've forgotten a little bit about today. But in the 1940s in Paris, she was just as famous as Josephine Baker. And we know from accounts by Matisse's friend, the writer, uh, oh God, Ar uh, Aragon, that uh, Matisse saw performances of Dunham, these highly acclaimed mm -hmm. performances of Dunham, and then evoked that with his collage or cut paper paintings. So, so then, you know, there's a cert still a certain amount of skepticism. Well, you know, there's no written record saying that Matisse saw Catherine Dunham. So I work with a, one of our research associates and we go, about, uh, we go back and we excavate uh, costume photos of Dunham uh, and posters of her performances in various Paris theaters. And you look at the, uh, the costumes that she's wearing in those images from the 40s, and you look at what Matisse is doing, and you can see the, the placement of the legs and the uh, adornments, the ornamentation of the, of the crown-like headdress and the shoulders and waist. He's clearly evoking um, those images. So a lot of times we tend to be skeptical about some of this material because we just haven't done, we haven't scratched, we haven't looked beneath the surface mm -hmm. and really tried to find the archival material that really isn't that hard to find. Mm -hmm. It's just there if you decide to look for it. So I think one of the things that I really hope will come out of this is a commitment by more our, our peers, our uh, curatorial and academic, to do a little bit more digging. Mm -hmm. One of the things I feel really optimistic about about, uh, about the Orsay show is that uh, the curators, uh, the Orsay curators, who are my co-curators for that show, really did decide to go back and look at certain images that have been in their collection, have mm -hmm. been in the collection of the Louvre for 160, 200 years and more. And they had these generic titles, you know, La Negresse, mm -hmm. uh, a term that uh, in French is certainly a pejorative, mm -hmm. racialized term. It's, it's a way that you name something in a way to render it anonymous mm -hmm. and generic mm -hmm. and not as an individual, but as a type, as a racial mm -hmm. type. But these women's names were recorded by the artists themselves. And so one of the things that the Orsay is really undertaking is to rename some of these La Negresses uh, as portrait of mm. using the name of the model, mm -hmm. the known name of the mm -hmm. model. So I think these are types of uh, re-examinations and excavations that all of us can do and should do with our collections and as we think about ideas for, ex for exhibitions and really be able to add some original thinking to the subjects that we all think we already know really well. Absolutely.